So Sarah and I are trying to learn this new platform that we're using here on the podcast. The listeners don't understand the technical expertise that it requires to execute one of these podcasts. I mean, I don't understand. I'm getting a little glimpse right now. It looks intense. I don't understand either. <laughs> but I have a very complicated looking thing in front of me. There's there's levels and there's things going up and down and we're being measured and I'm sure analyzed in all sorts of ways that we don't even want to know about. <laughs> but all of it is to serve the purpose of delivering a great audio experience to the listeners. I love that. Yes. And we're not going to talk about any of that because neither of us understand it. What we're going to talk about is you, Sarah Botsford. You're a Denver hairdresser and an educator who focuses on dimensional lived-in color. I think a lot of us know that, that phrase and know that thing. And you're on the BTC team, which is super cool. So why don't we start with uh, how did you get into this business in the first place? So this um, industry or my career path started, I would say probably when I was like a little kid. So I was surrounded by hairstylists. My mom was a hairdresser. Um, my dad's sister was a hairstylist and she actually owned hair schools all across Canada. And my mom ah. attended. Yeah, it was kind of cool. So my mom attended one of those hair schools and that's actually how she met my dad. So to me, hair like ah. hair is kind of like a love story that created uh, my life, essentially. Um so, I mean, growing up, I was always watching my mom do hair. She had a home-based salon in our basement and um, had like a really flexible schedule. So growing up, I'm like, this is awesome. My mom is home. She gets to make people feel pretty. The whole place smelled like perm solution, which I kind of loved. Um, funny. And yeah, and I really just grew up wanting to do hair. Um, but the funny part about that is when I told my mom I wanted to be a hairstylist, you can you would think, she'd be like, I love that, same industry. And she was like, absolutely not. You're going to be poor the rest of your life. <laughs> and at that time, yes, honestly, that she helps. probably wasn't wrong. But <laughs> That's really funny. Um, now, hold on a minute. Are you saying that you wanted your mom to tell you you're going to be poor for the rest of your life as a hairstylist? Or are you saying that you were? she was encouraging you by not saying that you're going to be poor? I was hoping she would be encouraging me to go into hair, and it was the opposite. She was like, no, I don't want you to go into hair. You're going to be poor. And She did say you were going to be poor. Got yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And she wasn't wrong. I mean, when I started out doing hair, I was very poor. <laughs> and uh, like, thank God the industry has evolved, and I made a couple different decisions along the way. And um, yeah, that's kind of how it all started was was – Mom telling me not to do it, and I was stubborn and said, well, I'm going to go do this. It's so funny because after about 300 interviews, the number of people who were discouraged by their parents to go into hair is probably a vast majority. I mean, certainly not 100%, but probably 75%. And of course, by definition, I'm talking to people who have chosen hair as an industry and people who have been successful in the industry. So it's, why do you think that is? I mean, do you think it's because, and we've delved into this already a little bit, but back in the day, or at least the reputation of the industry across the population in general is that you don't make a lot of money in it. Yeah. I think I speak so to this a lot. What's changed? I think there's just a shift. Uh, I, it's almost twofold. I think there's a bit of a shift in the industry uh, or perceived understanding of hairstylists in society that like there's a group of people that think that we make more money, but there's still a large group of people or large population that think that hairstylists are financially struggling. And I always speak to this in classes. Like I think hairstylists as a whole, we have this collective responsibility to start changing people's perception of what hairstylists actually are. You know, like we are able to make over six figures now. We can make our schedules the way we want them to be. We can make our schedule suit exactly what our family life needs. Uh, but I think it's like us charging our worth and, you know, not being kitchen beauticians anymore. Mm hmm. hundred percent. We're going to get into that a little bit more, but, uh, the, I'm sure the listeners have heard you, uh, use the word a boot and, <laughs> and you mentioned, you mentioned the country of Canada. And so they now know that you're from Canada and 
Canada is one of those places that's kind of fun to make fun of. I mean, <laughs> it, right? Isn't it? And, yeah, and, and I say I mean, that maybe because I don't really have anything to make fun of. But like you turn on the TV and sometimes, you know, the TV show, for example, is making fun of Canada. Why do people like to make fun of Canada? <laughs> This is such a funny question. I'm like scared to answer this. I don't want to offend anybody, but that's so Canadian. We don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> right. Um, probably exactly that. I think they're just a group of really nice people that pronounce things kind of silly, like, oh, I'm going out of the house and I'm going to go about town. And, um, you know, we like simple things, hockey and Tim Hortons coffee. And, you know, we apologize <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. And your police officers or your peace officers ride on horseback. Is this correct? I mean, the RCMP does ride horses. Yeah. Royal Canadian Police. What? Royal Canadian Mounted Police Force. Mounted Police Force. Okay. One of these days I'm going to make it up to Canada and I'm going to see this for myself. There's a lake up there, by the way, up, um, you know, on the western side of the country that is beautiful. And there's a Four Seasons Hotel. And I've seen it on Instagram yes. 50 times. And I have to make it up there. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I think it's Lake Louise and Chateau Frontenac, I think it's called. And I've never been there myself, but I, I also know exactly what you're talking about. So a, a boot. A boot. <laughs> and so wh where in Canada are you from? Um, I was born in Winnipeg, uh, but the last 10 years of my life, I've been living in a really, really small town called Fort Francis. Uh, it's directly okay. above International Falls, Minnesota, like 7,000 people, re really small town. And probably amazingly beautiful. Oh, it's stunning. It's beautiful. Very cold, yeah. but beautiful. Okay. So uh, did you go to the same hair school uh, network that your family was involved with? No. So I, at that time, like where I grew up, uh, it was right next to Fargo, North Dakota. So I went to the Slant Professional Academy in Fargo and um, kind of started out my career there. And then, of course, along the way, uh, I, I, this isn't even what you asked me, but I guess I'm just carrying on. But <laughs> please, <laughs> um, someone said to me, probably like in my first year of, of doing hair, um, so is this all you're going to do now? And <laughs> right. Like every hairstylist has heard this question asked to them. And mm -hmm. I did really well in high school and I, I got good grades. And I think it like confused people that I was just doing hair. And, um, I know no one can see me doing air quotes, but air quotes, yes. <laughs> I'm just doing hair. And it rattled mm -hmm. me because this person like mattered to me. And I was like, you know what? I'm no, I'm going to do more. So I enrolled in pre-law <laughs> Which is actually so, wow. so okay. funny now to think out loud because really I just wanted to wear pantsuits. Like I, I didn't really have an interest in that. Um, and then eventually found myself in history and I got a history degree and then ended up oh. in education and got an education degree and then was teaching high school history. But then the whole time doing oh. that, I was doing hair to pay for all these other things that I thought I wanted to do. Um, Amazing. And, and, and when you're doing hair, were you doing it, uh, like in a salon or you're doing it like your friends and on the side? A bit of both. Sometimes it was in salons. Sometimes it just didn't work out with school. So it was just on the side, like, you know, back in my kitchen doing people's hair, washing them in the sink. Um, but I loved it. It was just, it was kind of like a, at that time it was more of like a hobby that like was side money to, to help cut costs. Um, and then when I was actually teaching, I would, uh, have, we call it supply teaching, but basically it's like subbing. So it was like teaching at a high school in our town and after I would get done working there, I would all, at that time I did have a salon job. I would still go to the salon at night and take clients throughout the evening, uh, and then would teach during the day. And then after a while of doing that, I'm like, this is insane. Like I'm not happy, uh, in the classroom. High school kids really didn't care that much about history. And I honestly like never remembered any dates. So I was like, this, this, <laughs> this is not going so well. That's funny. Um, and then I just decided full-time hair was going to be my, my direction. I imagine teaching high school it can be very unfulfilling. I, it can also be very fulfilling. I guess this is the case with any educator. But high school, I just, I envision myself and many other kids sitting there and just wanting to be anywhere other than history class. Yes. I mean, I, I, mean, I think what I like about teaching now is like, 
you truly feel like you're you're sharing an energy exchange with that person or the people that are sitting in your class or you're inspiring them somehow or you've shared something with them that's going to change their their life in some small capacity uh which yeah. maybe is thinking too grandiose of it all but that's how i feel in history class mm-hmm. you're like let me tell you about all these people that died in horrendous ways and think that they're somehow going to be enthused about this. Like, I don't know. It just was right. <laughs> right. not for me. Totally, totally get it. And I think I needed to get a lot more mature and older to recognize the, the value of history. Because I remember thinking through the first 20 years of my life, like, why do we have to spend all this time figuring out or learning about what happened so long ago? It's irrelevant. Yeah. But yeah, that's stupid. And uh, it's 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 much smarter to recognize the fact that history is very important because the same things happen over and over and over and over again. So if you know a little bit about it, then it's going to help you in the future. Yeah. OK, so you think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. Well, you hope. Yeah. So uh, however, through this process, you were developing this talent uh or your passion and, and all, or not or, but your talent and passion for educating, which uh, you probably had no idea was going to serve you in the future as a hairstylist educator, right? Oh, truly. Like, I, I mean, I'm very happy that, you know, that Bachelor's of Education wasn't wasted, I guess. Uh, and it has been very helpful in, in what I'm doing now. Okay, so you... Uh, decided at a certain point to focus on hair. And so tell us what you did. Did you uh, just uh, go from part-time in the salon you were working in to full-time or, or how did you approach it? Uh, that, the, that was exactly it because I was working evenings and then I went in full-time, um, basically stopped teaching altogether, uh, which also was a hard decision because to tell people that, you know, take the traditional route with their, you know, like get a degree, get a job, uh, to explain to family members, like, okay, I'm going to give up my pension and give up my retirement, my health benefits, my summers off. Like that was very hard to wrap their head around. Um, mm-hmm. and I did have people that supported me. I don't feel like anyone was like, no, 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 don't do that. But they're like, okay, good luck. <laughs> it was, mm-hmm. was more the, the demeanor. Um, yeah, I never have ever once that was, I think like almost 10 years ago now, um, have never regretted making that decision. So. That's great. Okay. So you become full-time hair and you're loving it. You're not regretting it. And so give us kind of the, uh, the timeline. How long was it until you started, uh, educating and things like that? That was probably, so I think there's a period of time where I was, you know, behind the chair and that was my focus. And, I remember vividly going to a behind the chair show. I'd never been to one. um, And someone said, you know, you should really check it out. So I bought a ticket, went by myself. And that was like the most eye opening experience of my career up until that point. Like, I did not know that there were, you know, hairstyles working with brands as ambassadors or hairstyles doing um, stage presenting or platform work or like Naha competition. I didn't even know that that stuff existed. Uh, so after that, I came home and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to be a stage presenter. Like that was my goal. It's like, I'm going to educate people. I'm going to be on stage one day. And when I told my coworkers that they're like, okay, cool. Like they, they just, they're like, you're being weird, whatever. weird, whatever. <laughs> um, but that was like a turning point for me because then it was like, okay, how am I going to get there? I also, like I mentioned, was in this really small town. So people weren't really thinking outside the box yet anyways. Um, So when I started taking photos of clients, um, you know, to put on Instagram, that was even weird for my clients. Like, what, why? Why are we taking my picture? And my coworkers were like, well, why? Why are you taking them? You know, everything was like, this is weird. Um, So this was when Instagram was new. Yes. What, like mid 2010s? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right in that, right in that time period. And I also like didn't really know the first thing about Instagram. I was like, oh, this, this picture is fine. I'll put this on there. And now I look back, I'm like, oh Lord. (laughs) Everybody does that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But that I would say probably from like timeline, choosing to do hair to starting to educate was probably like five years. Okay. All right. So where you are Actually, let, let me ask this question. So as you're 
kind of transitioning from behind the chair full time to educating. And we'll, of course, tell the listeners what kind of educating you're doing. But how, and the reason I'm asking this question, I'm going to say first before I ask the core of the question, is a lot of the listeners are thinking, you know, they also want to do something like this. They also want to educate and, and all that. Because maybe they're feeling bored behind the chair. Maybe not, but maybe they are. And so talk about that transition from behind the chair full time to doing what you're doing now. I love that question because I think with anything, it's like you change your thoughts, you change your life, right? I mean, that's exactly what I had to do. It's like, okay, I am going to, I had to stop seeing myself as just like a small town stylist and see myself as what I wanted to be. It was like, no, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be successful. So changing the thoughts, um, I think is the first thing. And then in terms of educating, if someone is like wanting to dabble into that realm, for me, the biggest thing is like, make sure you know how to educate. There's a difference between standing in front of a room full of people and just do hair versus standing in a room full of people and educate them on what you're doing. Um, so making sure they have some sort of plan and learning goals or have an outcome of what they want to like their, their audience to take away from the class. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So the, um, the, there's a financial component to this. There's a financial consideration to this because what pays better? I mean, you, you tell us what pays better behind the chair or educating? I mean, in a one, like if you're looking at it like per day, yeah, you're going to make a, a good amount of money in a, in a one day class. But long term, like I think it's always easy to sell out your first few classes. Being able to consistently sell classes is another thing because there's always new independent educators coming out. There's brand education. There's just like always new competition that you have. So for a stable, consistent income, I think like obviously build your clientele and have a good, you know, have have your home base behind the chair. Right. And from from what I can imagine and have heard and from what I understand, a one day class doesn't just require one day of your time. Yeah. You have to do everything to build a foundation to actually have that one day class, right? Yes. Whether it's the all the work on Instagram that you do over years to um, becoming known as an educator, the time you spend getting decent at it. Um, if you're uh, education is going to be supported by a brand. Of course, you have to develop that relationship, which takes a long time. And then actually, when it comes to executing the class, there's marketing for it. There's planning yeah. of it. There's where is it going to be? There's And so there's many, many hours. I mean, what? There's probably oh, absolutely. five times the amount of, of time spent in the planning than the actual executing of the class, right? That you could not have explained it more correctly. <laughs> yeah, good. So you don't even have to answer that question. That wasn't even a question. I was like, that was I think you talking. covered it all. <laughs> no, it was perfect. Like you made it. You made it easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so usually in these in these conversations, I like to talk about you know the exciting things, and I like to talk about maybe the not so great things, right? Because a lot of people see only the exciting things and then they start to do it. And then it's like, yeah. oh shit, I didn't realize that it was going to take me three weeks to plan one class, you know, but that yeah. is, that is the reality of some of these things. Okay. So let's talk about what kind of educating you're doing. Um, you know, like uh, how often, where, and what are you teaching? So I'm about to kind of actually kind of wrap up my um, teaching for this year. I, I always teach to some sort of lived in uh, coloring technique. This year, I was really focusing on brunettes just because I feel like there's a lot of blonde specialists and there's not a lot of brunette specialists. Uh, my next one is in Boston on May 1st. So I don't know when this airs, but <laughs> I'm assuming it'll be passed. Um, and then probably I'm guessing I might add a few like pop-up classes in the fall. Um, and if not next year, we'll start the new, the next tour of, of classes, but normally something regarding lived in hair coloring. Okay. And so why lived in hair coloring? I know that you mentioned the blonding thing and yes, blonding is all the rage. I, I feel like it's been all the rage for a long time, but, um, so, so you've kind of got your niche. What, um, I assume this is your specialty with your clients too? 
Yeah, I, I work a lot. I mean, I do do everything, but I would say the majority of my clientele is brunette or redhead. Um, and I just felt like for me, like you're saying niche, like there was kind of like this area of the market that wasn't saturated. And mm-hmm. I was, I enjoy that. I like seeing the different tones on brunette. So for me, it just was like something I really loved. Mm-hmm. And is it brand supported? Uh, Are you with a brand? I am a brand specialist with Trust. So they mm-hmm. uh, provide like um, different swag for the swag bags. Um, aside from that, wait, wait, I, hold on. Wait, swag or swag? Swag. <laughs> I guess I say big, so maybe I should say swig. <laughs> big. I'm, I'm going to try to incorporate that accent into my words for the rest of the episode. I get made fun I'll of every single time. I'll do it horribly, though. I look forward to hearing this because I get made fun of every time I say big or I also say supper instead of dinner. And my like self, like my Texas friends are like, God, you sound like you're 80. <laughs> <laughs> supper is just so much more wholesome. Like let's have supper. I, like, if we're gonna, yes, if we're gonna have supper, I just feel like there's gonna be a warm fire in the corner of the room. Yes, the mm-hmm. smell we're of eat like charcoal <laughs> stew. We're eating stew together. You know, I can yeah, like the it. family. Yeah, very much. If you're having dinner, it could be any kind of thing. You could be by yourself. You know, and it's it could be a microwave dinner. Yeah, but it's yeah. not supper. Yep, supper. I like supper. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're getting uh, trust is sending you swag bags, and as part of your cl- class, is it class? It it's class, isn't it? I mean, I just say class. Okay, class. Yeah, and you say that perfectly, like with zero accent. Um, I've been of course, the Canadians are like Canadians are like, why is she saying class instead of class? <laughs> anyway, okay. We do have Canadian listeners, by the way. I, I haven't looked in a couple months, but. Um, we have a lot of Canadian listeners, so here you go. Oh, I love okay. that. So, so you do the class. Is it a one day class, multiple day class? Uh, normally, they're one day classes. I've done one two day class, and um, I was I was pretty tired at the end of it, which is funny because teachers go to work every single day, and you know, like a normal work week, I like teach two days. I'm like, oh my lord, I'm never going to function the rest <laughs> of the week. <laughs> That's really funny. But yeah, one okay. day, one day class. All right. So you've got Boston coming up. This is definitely going to air after the Boston thing, but you're going to have some uh, later in the year. And then between, um, like all educators, you have a summer. Um, not really. I'm just kidding. You're going to be in the salon doing your clients. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I just, I recently moved to Denver. Uh, so that's been actually kind of wild too, just rebuilding my entire client base. And, um, I mean, everyone's new, so I'm looking forward to the summer just to, you know, keep meeting new people. And I actually just hired my first assistant ever in my life. So that's also going to be new. And so how long have you been in Denver? I moved here in September. So I think I'm on my eighth month. Okay. Yes. Very new. Okay. So, and you found a salon there Yes. and you, is it a commission-based salon or independent salon? So it's both. I started out, it's called Craft Collective and um, anyone listening might know Hair by Mick. It's his salon. He's a good friend of mine. Um, so the, I started in the commission side and then during that time he was opening up a second location and then that's all for renters. So now I rent in the, in the new space. Got it. Okay. And how's it gone so far? It's eight months in. You showed up with no clients. You have a nice Instagram following. Uh, so I don't know, maybe that's helped you. So tell us what, I mean, what's, it was probably nerve wracking as hell. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Cause also my husband is full, I'm dual citizen. So it was no problem me coming here, but my husband's Canadian. And, uh, so we were coming oh, here with only my income. So that was extra stressful. <laughs> Uh, okay, so wait a second. Why? So then, why uh, Denver? Denver just, you know, it's funny because we were actually always trying to go to Minnesota, uh, which is where my sisters are from, and Denver just kind of gave us everything we were looking for. Like it had seasons, but it was warmer. It wasn't as cold as Minnesota or Canada. Um, and just like I feel like the uh, hair industry in Denver is really, really thriving. Like I feel like stylists are making a very good income here. 
Um, mm. We are char- like Craft Collective is very much a luxury salon, so I, c- I knew I could make a good income. And not to mention, it was by an airport. So for like working with brands or working with BTC mm. or any opportunities that involve travel, like I could easily fly out of here. I love Denver. Denver has been a fast growing city. Uh, for the last few years, and uh, I love going there, and we have a salon there. Salon Republic has a salon in Broomfield. Oh, awesome. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's great. So um, I, I think it's probably a good place to want to build a clientele because you have an influx, a growing number of people. So how did you do it? How did you build a clientele? And, and you, maybe you're not full 100% right now, but uh, I'd be surprised maybe if you were. But uh, tell, us, tell us how it's gone. It has been uh, tremendous, and I I would have never expected it to grow as fast as it did because I think I just also probably struggle from serious imposter syndrome. I'm like, who would want to even come see me? They don't they don't know me. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's been really good. Instagram, like you mentioned, has been very helpful. Like uh, one of the first things I did was just start changing my language on Instagram. Like it's always definitely been geared towards hairdressers uh, and like to offer education. And then I shifted it to, to speak towards the client. Like, um, this is how you're going to feel when you come to the salon. This is this types of services you're going to get. Um, just very much like client focused language, which uh, was great. Hashtags were surprisingly really helpful. Like, uh, I've had many people come in and saying like, Hey, I found you through like Denver balayage hashtag or Denver hairstylist hashtag. Um, Mm -hmm. hashtags are very important. (laughs) You are you're killing me here. <laughs> no, not as important as the swag the bags. The swag bags can't forget those. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, okay. So Instagram. So you're using the Instagram. You're using the gram effectively. And so of your clients that you have now, what percentage came from Instagram? I would say probably like I would probably say like forty percent came from Instagram. Pretty good. And then what about the others? The others, I which this was so cool to see. Uh, the biggest thing is has been referrals. Like every single client that came in, I just asked them. I was like, "Hey, look, I'm new to town. I don't know anyone here. I would so appreciate if you could refer any of your friends that have hair like you." And I was really careful to be like, "Send any of your friends," because the first time I did that, they were sending me like their mom, and she ha- wanted like a <sighs> like <laughs> you know like a gray touch up. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it wasn't yeah. the market I was looking for. Um, and right. people did. They like I have every time someone sits in the chair now, they're like, oh, so and so sent me in. Um, and really, I should probably make a referral wow. program and reward these people. But I'm that's been the biggest thing is just people sending in friends and family. You so you haven't had to do anything uh, in regard to a reward or a program for your clients in order to get the the word of mouth going. You simply asked. I just asked them. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing I'm what trying that to does. Teach, <laughs> it's amazing what asking can do. I'm trying to teach my kids who are 10 and 11 to ask things, yeah. you know, whether it's, you know, water at dinner, you know, asking the <laughs> server for more water. Because when kids are little, they look at mommy or daddy and they're like, you know, can I have more water? Or I want more water or give me yeah. more water now or some variation, right? And so getting, getting them out of the discomfort of asking a stranger is very important. And here we are in adulthood in a career, and it means a lot to our lives and our families' lives. And simply asking can be just be so important. Yet people so don't want to do it. Well, and I think because mm-hmm. it, there's this like fear that you're going to look like not busy enough or you're going to look green or, you know, there's this, this fear of that. But I just... I think if you're just honest with people and you're, you know, it it just never hurts to ask. (laughs) Right. Agreed. Okay. So, um, you, you chose a salon where the prices are high ish you implied. And so that's helped you, um, have a a higher price, uh, starting in a new market and it's been eight months. So maybe not quite soon enough for you to worry about changing your prices upward. Have you done, have you made any changes to your prices? I haven't. I'm honestly still getting comfortable charging what I am charging. So I don't foresee myself increasing anytime soon. Uh, Once it's, to me, it's kind of more about supply and demand. Like once I have 
way more demand than I'm able to satisfy, then I probably will do a price increase at that point. Right now, I'm still just like I just started double booking. So once that gets too full, then I'll probably consider that as an option. But right now, I'm happy where they're at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the assistant. For the first time ever, you've hired an assistant and you just said you started double booking and those two things are probably related. Yes. Yeah. I actually felt like I was losing clients because single booking, they were having to wait so far out to get in to see me. So I was like, okay, there's only one of me. What are my options? Um, so of course everyone's like, you need to get an assistant, <laughs> which has actually right. been a lot more work than I thought it would be. I thought I just hired an assistant, but I guess hiring an assistant means having an employee. So I'm right now kind of learning all the, you know, uh, the things about having an employee, like filing for their insurance and how to set up payroll and getting my business set up with the state of Colorado, just like all these extra things that I did not know you had to do to have an employee. I thought you just like hired them and paid them through Venmo. So <laughs> yeah. And those are just the administrative things. Yeah. And you haven't started talking about the actual managing of the employee. Yes. And, she's and yeah. And it's, it's a very dynamic sort of thing that happens. Uh, you know, it's not the same. Like your employee is a human. And so she's going to come <laughs> in and be in a good mood one day and she'll be in a bad mood the next day and she'll be good at some things. And she'll be bad at other things. And all the myriad little things that we as humans have as part of our nature. And so as an employer, you have to deal with all those things and if you do it well, the employee can help you exponentially. If you do, if you do it poorly, or it, 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 and when I say do it, it's everything including choosing the person, right? If you choose the person yeah. poorly, if you choose the wrong person, maybe not not the right person, then it can make things worse. Yeah, which these are all the things that I'm now extra nervous about as you're talking about them. <laughs> Uh oh, I'm making you nervous. And by the way, I'm, I'm I can feel it now. I'm making all the listeners nervous. They're like, oh shit, they're starting to sweat. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, a few of the listeners have recently hired their first uh, apprentice or assistant. Yeah, I'm getting hives. I'm scratching my <laughs> face. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're about to fire your new assistant right yeah. after we get off the uh, out of the interview. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm like I'm sorry. You, I was on this podcast. I can't have you anymore. Uh. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I think the good news is that in in my experience, I think the good news is that a lot of it's common sense from my experience of having employees for a long time. A lot of it's common sense and it's just the willingness to actually do the common sense. You know, some of us don't, we know that we need to do X, Y, and Z, but sometimes we don't feel like doing X, Y, and Z. Maybe we don't feel like doing X, Y, and Z for like three weeks and then X, Y, and Z um, becomes harder. And, and so doing X, Y, and Z, whether you feel like it or not, is a very important part of managing a, a human. That's good advice. And I'm going to put that in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, good, good. We actually have episodes that focus on hiring an assistant where somebody talks for, you know, 45 minutes on the ins and outs of it. So if, since we've kind of um, gone into this territory, uh, anybody, any listeners who, who want to hear more about it, you can, you can actually search on Apple, the Apple podcast app, by the way, uh, for any sort of topic like this. And uh, supposedly the search engine, the new search engine for Apple podcast app will generate episodes that, that have specific topics, topics. Okay. Ooh, that's so there helpful. you go. Yes. What about client behavior? Have you noticed any changes in client behavior? We, we got a couple transitions here in with your situation. Of course we had COVID and then you moved, but have you, have you noticed anything in, changing in client behavior? I mean, yeah, that's tough for me maybe specifically to speak to just because I kind of left my clientele as COVID, as things were reopening. That's right around the time I was like, I'm out um, moving out of Canada. But based here, like in Denver, I feel like clients are spending more money on their hair than I've ever seen. Like, I don't feel like there's been a, I, I would feel like more people are like investing in their hair than before. Yeah, good. 
Of course, we have this thing called inflation. And, you know, across the economy, everything has gone up in prices. And, of course, as all of us in the hair business know, we're pretty bad at increasing our prices. And so I've been beating the drum of keeping your eyes on your prices to match inflation. Otherwise, you end up making less money. You've made the transition to Denver. You're only eight months in. You're already charging high prices. So it sounds like you don't need to do anything there for a while. But you also said that your clients were having to book too far out because you're single booking. So now you're double booking. So that does imply that at a certain point, you know, maybe the one year mark, you could put some upward pressure on your prices. But yeah. you, you've got you've got a number of things going on. So maybe you don't need to worry about that right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a minute. Okay, so um, sometimes when somebody is in their career, kind of like what I'm sensing where you are right now, they start getting hit up with different opportunities. Like you go to your DMs and all of a sudden there's a brand, maybe a brand you've heard of who's DMing you or a brand you haven't heard of, uh, haven't heard of who's DMing you. Uh, have you started to deal with that issue of where to um, take advantage of opportunities versus where to ignore them? Uh, yeah, actually, I would say probably in the past like six months, this has really, really picked up. I've definitely been getting more um, like collaboration opportunities or different campaign options. And it, it's exactly like that. Like some of them seem like really good fit. So I'm like, yeah, I love this. I'm really big on like, I want them to send me their product first so I can see if it's something I truly want to talk about because I don't want to, you know, do something just to make money. Uh, and then sometimes I get campaigns. I'm like, why on earth did you reach out? Like Qdoba wanted me to talk about a burrito and the payment was two frozen dinners. <laughs> oh, come on. Are you serious? <laughs> like Qdoba, like go, like I'm not even in the food market. I don't know. It just seemed like a very weird fit. Um, on Instagram, they wanted you to promote Qdoba. Qdoba. And then I could take a coupon to Walmart because they were coming out with like a frozen food option in retail stores and I could get two wow. frozen meals. <laughs> That's amazing. So, like, wow. so that is a one-way ticket to the dumpster bin in terms of opportunities yeah. to accept. Yes. Uh, to accept. That's really funny. So uh, what other sorts of opportunities have been coming your way via DM and other ways? Most of the time, obviously, it's hair related, uh, which those I do consider because as long as it's part of like my niche or my brand, um, I'll look at that. But sometimes it's things like which I'm open to. They were options like like t a teeth whitening service or something that just fell in the realm of beauty, like skincare, like a couple skincare companies were sending things to me. And I'm like, why do you think I have wrinkles? Like. <laughs> I'm sure uh, it's because they think you have good skin and you would be a good model for their, um, you know, advocate. For yeah, their we'll product. go. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. Yeah. No, 100 <laughs> percent. I mean, think think about the number of people who promote brands, skin brands specifically. None of them have bad skin. The the, the weight loss uh, products out there. Right. Like. I'm sure that not everybody who's promoting the weight loss product was overweight before they yeah. started marketing for this company, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's just the nature of it. So uh, is there um, uh, what are your considerations when reading when thinking about these opportunities? How much time, how much money? Like what what's yeah. the how's the mind? Yeah, thinking so. Go? It's kind of like usually they'll come with like some sort of set of obligations, like whether they want, you know, a real a Instagram post, a story or an Instagram live or a combination of those things. So I have my own media kit that has my pricing set up and I normally just send that to the brand and that just like reduces some of like the communications. Uh, and then if they like my pricing and they want to move ahead, great. Um, if I don't really want to work with them. Um, cause sometimes the requirements will be insane. Like, like there's one I did, and this is one I really learned my lesson on actually. They, they wanted two minute long videos. They wanted, which is long, like to make a minute long video, you, you know, that's like probably for sure half an hour of like filming, editing. And then, I mean, even more time of editing, like that's a bit of planning. Um, yep. but then they also wanted creative control. So they wanted to, uh, have me send briefs of my script, which I don't really work that way. I, I like being candid. I like, you know, 
if I film it, it doesn't feel right, I'll like change something. Um, they also wanted an Instagram live. They wanted all my, um, reels to stay on the page for X amount of time. I couldn't talk about competitive brands for a really long amount of time, uh, which I think was a year. And it was like $500. And at that time I was like, $500. Heck yeah, I'm going to do this. So I did it. And by the end of it, I was like, that was way too much work for not enough Mm -hmm. money. So now I kind of base it on like, you know, having that media kit was really helpful. Like this is what it's going to cost you for a reel. This is what's going to cost you for, you know, the whole works. You know, it just makes it a little bit easier for me to know what to accept. It's a totally different business. Yeah, it is. Right. I mean, you you all of a sudden are running a media business. Yeah. And yes, it's a small media business, but it's a media business. You've got a media kit that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And then uh, th- producing the things that you're actually signing up for, like the like the one minute uh, video, and then giving them creative control, that means that you're going to put all that effort into making the video. You're going to send it to them. Yes. They're going to come back and say, you need to make changes Right. So there's all of a sudden this this one minute video is taking you a long time. Absolutely. And the the edits are what was actually in that specific example, I did have to make changes to part of it. And I was like, I had to make sure my hair looked the same as the other scenes and make sure the clothes I was wearing were in the same scene. Like it's just it was so much work. Media production. Oh, my God. This is and this is the stuff that I I don't think a lot of people really think about. Yeah, which is fun. I like I like creating content. That's probably one of my favorite things to do. But yeah, that was when it's not in your control. It's it's less fun. Less fun. But of course, even if you enjoy it, enjoy it or not, you still have to make sure that you're getting paid appropriately for it. If, If it takes you 15 hours. Of, of stuff. You know, a lot of a lot of the time these days is just in the back and forth communication. Yes. Yeah. I'm I mean, I'm thinking about right now, um, we're, we're going to take the kids on a vacation this summer and it's going to be, you know, a couple weeks of vacation. And we've already spent I mean, my wife and I together, we probably spent 15 hours just on communicating with the hotels or the tour guides or the thing. And these are the, you know, yeah. I didn't think it was going to be this much time. You almost need to hire just, like a travel manager that just does it for you. <laughs> we, and we have a travel agent no. too. So, but it's still taking that much time because we're communicating with her. And then she's sending us all these options. So we have to go through all the options. And then, well, if you want to make a good choice of which options, then you have to go online. You have to Google search, you know, these four options. And then you have to, you know, anyway. So these are the things about life and business that kind of creep up and can potentially, I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, of course, but it can, t- it can potentially cause you to feel overwhelmed and, you know, and burdened. And I know that, that in our business and the hair industry, when we get to a certain level, we start to kind of look at all these opportunities and we start to spread ourselves out really thin. And the next thing you know, you have 14 things that you need to do. You're not even sure if you're getting paid enough for some of these ancillary things. And you're like, it sounded so cool, but how did I get myself here? Well, and to keep it like, you know, a part of your own brand and authentic to what you're trying to represent. Like sometimes I'm trying to still figure out the difference between, and I feel like it's something I've gotten the hang hang of now, but initially when I was creating content for brands, it was like, almost like a commercial. I'm like, this is this product. This is what this product does. And now I'm learning, okay, I have to incorporate this thing into things that I'm already doing into the types of videos that I make. Um, and then it's more authentic to myself because anyone that comes to my page, if they get like a first hand, um, you know, like a first impression of my page, I want it to be authentic because that's the only way they're going to know that I'm, I'm being me. And then I know I'm being myself too. Totally. I think you nailed it right there. If you can incorporate it into what you're already doing, make sure you're getting paid for it properly and kind of work it into your system. It could be very rewarding. Absolutely. Yeah. So what keeps you up at night? Oh, everything. Oh my God. I have the, I don't sleep. I lay down and I'm like literally imagining types of reels that I could make the next day. Really? Oh, I, my, my poor husband, he's like, 
he'll like be talking to me and he goes, I know you're doing that thing right now where you're just saying words to make it seem like you're involved in the conversation, but what is going on behind the doors? That's awesome. (laughs) Like I'm very much a creative in my mind. Yeah. And it's so hard to get a hold of all those disparate thoughts that keep firing away. Right. And you know what? Good thoughts and bad thoughts. Like I was talking to my friend this morning about, um, you know, in a world where, you know, like getting up to to the level I I see myself at now, it's like, yeah, there's this imposter syndrome where you're like, am I really what other people see me as? Or I have friends in the industry who do amazing, huge things and they're rock stars. And it's hard not to compare yourself to them and be like, well, how come I'm not at that level yet? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, to just like be in the moment and actually be happy with where you're at. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. those thoughts creep in too. I'm not going to pretend it's all like just content and dandelions. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah. And that's one of the reasons we do these interviews. And one of the reasons people keep listening to this podcast, you know, and others like it because the, the perception uh, can be one thing and the reality can be something quite different. And I think that in general, uh, that could be really comforting to people who, yeah. who think that Sarah Botsford is like, got it all figured out and look how confident she is. And she does everything perfectly and, and here you are admitting that you have imposter syndrome. So, you know, the person listening to that is like, wow, even she has imposter syndrome. I thought I was the only one, you know, and having all this kind of depth of communication, I think, can be very valuable and comforting for people. Well, I, I mean, I know that I was always felt the same way when I heard other hairstylists that I admired talk about that. So I feel like in a position now, like, it's, I think it's almost like a responsibility to be honest. And again, authentic. I think I always come back to that word because anything I do on my page, I try to make sure it's like true to myself. And yeah, that that's comparison. That's a huge struggle. Like to, to always be comparing. I mean, it's Instagram, right? You see beautiful people on it all day long. Everyone's filtered and not a lot of it's real. So I think in, you get an opportunity to be real. You, you should take it. So, so, and yeah, if anyone thinks that I have it all figured out, I absolutely do not. And I'm, I'm one of those people that, yeah, I for sure compare and I, I'm wanting things that maybe I should just stop wanting and be happy with where, where I'm at. So, oh, yes, this is the inevitable just to just be happy, to be content <laughs> or to be ambitious. Right. And wouldn't it be nice? And it's probably like a fine balance. (laughs) And I think it's a fine balance. I think it absolutely is. You can be ambitious within a certain kind of level based on your composition, your personality, and what's good for you. And everybody's just got to figure out figure it out on their own. So let's talk. It's like it's good to be. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say it's like it's good to be ambitious, but important to enjoy every step along the way and acknowledge that you you have made a journey and you every step you get to, you should be happy for that success. Totally. Gratitude, all that kind of stuff. But you can still, you know, want to improve and all that. That's totally normal. And yeah, I think it's actually course. I think it's actually one of the elements, you know, when you talk to one of these uh you know, therapists that are famous or whatever. I think they like to talk about how, you know, upward, uh, maybe not momentum, but but upward movement in your life, the sense that you're getting better is an important component to being happy. So, I mean, they might even say it's an important component to being content. So maybe that's not even, those aren't even two, you know, opposites, contentment and ambition. Maybe you need a little bit of ambition and upward momentum to be content. I just blew everybody's mind right there. I love it. Like it's very (laughs) philosophical. (laughs) Very philosophical. Sometimes I devolve into some philosophy that I have no um, basis or right to even delve into. Well, I think that little soundbite should be played on repeat. People are like, that, that, this is a cyclical. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. So life behind the chair. What is the most difficult conversation that you've ever had with a client uh, behind the chair? Hmm. Most difficult. I'm trying to think. Honestly, it was the what first thing that comes to mind wasn't even actually hair related. It's definitely more like the client relationship uh, that was difficult I was doing a husband and wife's hair earlier on in my career. 
And the husband was like wildly in love with his wife. Like he was always planning surprises for her and like showing up with flowers. And he's like, really, I was like, oh my God, he's perfect. I'm like 19. I'm like, he's the perfect man. Uh, and the wife, she was kind of like, she, I mean, she was nice. She was a little different though. And one day she sits down and she just like looked disheveled. And she was like, I just have to tell you, Sarah, uh, I've been having an, I've been having an affair. And I was like, no, he's the perfect, why would you do this to him? And I'm, I'm trying to be unbiased because like, you know, it's really none of my business, but she's venting to me, telling me all these details I did not need to know. And I have to do her husband's hair the next day. And so to sit through his hair appointment, knowing that information, I, that to me was, it was, it was more difficult of what was not said versus what was said. I was like this poor man, he's going to have to find out or he's not going to find out. And I moved away. I don't know how that ended, but that to me, that was horrible. I hated knowing that information. Oh my God. As my kids would say, cringe. Yeah. Cringe. I was like, oh, cringe. So not really like a difficult conversation, but a difficult experience. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine, um, lots of kind of emotional baggage being dumped from the salon chair all the time. Yeah. That's, it's like you uh, absorb that, a lot of people's energy. <laughs> yeah. And and I love how you just left us hanging with that that conversation too. Like oh, we're all listening. We're like, we have to know. Did you I find would love out? to know. Did it, you should go on to Instagram and see if anything's happened with them. I know. I'm gonna have to yeah. do some creeping. Yeah. I'll definitely. report back. We'll have, <laughs> report back. We'll we'll put it as like a supplement to the episode. We'll, we'll wrap up the episode <laughs> and then we'll be like, and we're back with Sarah's worst yeah. conversation behind the chair. Okay. <laughs> um, so if you could wave a wand and change anything about the industry right now, what would it be? Ooh, this is going to stir some feathers and I hope it doesn't get perceived the wrong way, but I would say gender equality, honestly. Um, I feel like being that it's a 90% dominated female industry in higher up circles, like with brands and stage performers, it's, that's not represented. It's def- mm-hmm. I feel like not that any of the, the male counterparts are not as worthy because I think they absolutely are. They're incredibly talented um, and they deserve everything they get. But I also feel like there's a lot of incredibly talented women that I think don't get looked at maybe sometimes for opportunities. Not, not saying that like, that it should be me or anything, but I think there's like, it should be a little bit more balanced sometimes. Sure. I don't think you're going to ruffle any feathers by saying that. (laughs) I'm like the Canadian me is like dying right now. I'm like, Oh my God, it's controversial. (laughs) Oh geez. Am I really going to talk about this? Oh geez. Yeah. That was so bad. That was so like, I want Donovan to cut that, but Donovan, you don't have to cut that. We'll just let that ride. That was horrible. I knew that I was going to step over the line to show just how bad I am at accents. Well, it was a good effort. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for the effort. Okay. Well, yes, I think we all hear you on that one. Do you have any hair horror stories? Hair horror stories? Um, Yes. Yeah. It uh, it actually was totally my fault. I had this client and um, I had done her hair a couple times and I went on maternity leave. And in Canada, it's a year long. So for a whole year, she was seeing somebody else. And when I came back to her, she had brunette hair and she used to have highlights. And she was like, you know, I really want to go back to being lighter. And I was like, okay, yep, sure. Let's do it. And it was like my first week back in the salon. I start putting highlights in or like my foil work and just let it process as normal. Well, I wasn't remembering that underneath all that brown hair was the old highlights. Mm. So I go to start pulling foils and sure enough, her hair literally just came with the foil. (laughs) It was just like Mm. melting off and stretchy. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, I, I destroyed her hair and I wash it and I'm like, you can tell, right? It's just mush, absolute mush. And then I go to dry it and I'm like quickly, I like turned away from the mirror and I'm drying and I'm like, I'm just going to texturize it. So I just start texturizing, but there's really nothing to texturize because there's just, there's just no hair. Uh, like like how, how much no hair? Are we, are we like a pixie? It was this simply like, a color service we to from, a dramatic transformation? We went from like mid-length hair to like a bob, basically. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, it's still bad. Still bad, obviously. It was but, bad. Okay. And like, and yeah. the bob that she had wasn't in good condition. Like, it probably should have been a pixie. Right. And I was like, <laughs> I thought you would look really good in this length. I'm trying to hype it up. And then finally, there's it gets to the point. Where I'm like, I can't cover this up. And I just like come clean. I'm like, look, I I damaged your hair. Um, I'm going to give you some complimentary haircuts for a while. I, I went to her house that night and brought her like three different types of hair treatments. Like, and she actually continued seeing me a few times after that before she eventually went, <laughs> went somewhere else. I don't blame her, but that was a nightmare. It just is so common to all of the beauty school students out there or recent graduates. It's just so common. Even the best in our industry do it. Yeah. So you the just, important part is to learn. Yeah, and ask questions. Do a thorough consultation. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Any last words for the community? Oh, I wasn't prepared for this question. Um, I think I'm going to just touch back to like, you know, if you are actively using Instagram to grow your career or to work with brands or just to make a name for yourself, like my biggest advice for you is be yourself. Show the real you on your page. Be authentic. Um, don't feel like you have to fit in any sort of box. Awesome. Awesome. So fun meeting and talking, Sarah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it was nice to meet you too. Thank you for having me.